Okay, so I'm going to invite our first panelist, and you guys can come up from that side of the stage. I'm Ar Arna Padram from the CSIR. Um, she's a senior research, researcher in the Energy Center of the CSIR and holds a BSc honors in electric engineering and is currently finalizing her MSc in electrical engineering. Um, she's also a registered pro uh, professional engineer with the Engineering Council of South Africa, and she now performs and manages research work related to the just energy transition. So please welcome Artna. Okay, she's busy getting mic'd up, so she'll be on stage shortly. Um, our second panelist is David uh, Kawesha from Sasol. David is the current head of the Just Transition Office, and I think this is a word that you'll hear a lot of um, building on that green green hydrogen technology conversation we had earlier on. Um, his role is focused on formulating and implementing a just transition for Cecil, as well as determining the most appropriate green financing options to support Sasol's decarbonization pathway. Uh, David is a chemical engineer by training and has extensive research research development and demonstration experience over the past 15 years. Um, so welcome to David. I don't... Okay, he's also being mic'd up, so he'll be on the stage shortly. And then finally joining the panel is Stuart Bartlett from the IDC. Stuart started his career at the IDC as a, as a regional manager responsible for the, for the Eastern Cape and later as head of agency development and support department, which, which served as the catalyst for integrated, sustainable, local and regional development. He currently serves as manager for the Regional Partnerships Unit, focusing on developing partnerships between public, private, civil society and community sectors with the mandate to, with the mandate to bring the poor and marginalized into the center of the economy. So I look forward to hearing from him as well, and I believe he's also getting mic'd up, um, so he'll be on stage shortly. So that's going to be our, be our panel discussion for this session. I would just like to um, ask you that if you are on the Slido app, that you can put your questions up, um, and then if you're joining us from home, that you also just share your questions in here as well. And if you just do those as the conversation is going on. You know, so um, if you ask a question, then it's addressed on the panel. I'll then obviously not ask it later on. But if you allow, if you send through your questions as the conversation is happening, that allows us to manage the time as well, so we don't have to wait at the end to receive your questions. Um, but I do see people have been engaging, so um, I just want to send a few shout outs to some of the people who've jumped on, um, who are also people who I've consistently seen show up in previous sessions. So, um, hi Cord uh, Cordelia Davis, thank you so much for joining us. Hey Simpiwe, hi, hey Bandile, um, hey Nontlantla who's joining from Sekunda, uh, Skumbuzo who's joining from Free State, Siabonga, um, Oh, see, I didn't say he's joining us from. And then we also have a couple of people joining us from Bumalanga, so welcome. Uh, I think we've got one person who's joining us from um, Cape Town of the Western Cape, I think it was. Um, and a couple of other people joining us from Nalspreet and a few people here in Joburg. So welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for engaging. And I also see, I've seen some of your comments as well on Twitter. So please do continue to acting us at Sassel SA. And whatever you want to share, whether it's a picture, whether it's an image, whether it's a comment or a quote that stood out to to you, please remember to use hashtag build to last. Um, I believe we're just waiting for Stuart, so he will be virtually joining us. Awesome. Okay, so over to you, Abdullah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I uh, uh, was going to get a, a piece of paper on my computer, but uh, we must uh, pivot <laughs> as I put in my presentation. So I'm using my phone now for notes, etc. So. I'm not WhatsApping, I'm not responding to those blue ticks. Uh, I'm literally <laughs> using my phone to be able to facilitate the conversation. But it's uh, such a pleasure to have all three of you with us, uh, David, virtually. Uh, but I wanted to maybe open, as we always do in World Economic Forum style sessions, by giving each of you perhaps three to five minutes to share with us some of your work, some of your perspectives. And ladies first, so Aradna, let's go with you. Okay, um, is the presentation going to come up? Is it? Okay, um, all right. Uh, so, yeah, we do know that South Africa is a very coal dominated, um, also has a very coal dominated uh, energy system. And um, this leaves some opportunity for renewable energy um, and, you know, the, the likes of yourself to actually expand uh, into renewable and more green, uh, greener energy because of, of uh, the, the coal uh, intensive system that we currently have. 
Um, I just want to. Oh, is the ticket's there. Cool. Okay. Um, you just pick the middle. <laughs> so the green would be the next slide. Yeah. That big one, the big green. Yeah. No, the no that's the laser. Yeah. Oh, the other one. Oh, sorry. Yeah. My bad. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, so the status quo, as I've mentioned, is that we are uh, a very high, highly coal-dominated energy system, and um, this does leave uh, some room for the renewable energy opportunities that we have, um, because we need to transition from this high uh, carbon-intensive system to a low-carbon neutral system, uh, based on, on the agreements that we currently have for the Conference of Parties, based on climate change, and uh, for sustainability sustainability of, uh, of the world uh, as a whole. So um, adding to, to the problem that we have in terms of our carbon intensive system, we have load shedding and I'm sure all of you are, are aware of this um, with 2021 being actually the worst year of load shedding that we've currently had. Um, and this is not really uh, helping us uh, as, as a, a, a country to actually move economically forward. Um, adding to that is uh, the current coal fleet. We don't really have that much availability in terms of, uh, you know, the energy availability factors of our coal fleet, um, and the the uh, you know the um, uh, the whole uh, feasibility and and uh, cost of of this and maintaining such a system um, has really come to bite us as a country. Um, so, whilst we are experiencing uh, this energy intensive system, um, as well as load shedding, other countries globally are moving towards renewables, they've accepted it, they are, uh, you know, really increasing their renewable in intake um, and um, uptake. And countries like China are even moving to, to nuclear and, and other uh, gas energy as well. So uh, renewables is definitely significant to our system and would need to, uh, you know, or would really uh, help us in terms of an energy system to move forward to this green uh, energy system. So just to elaborate on, on some of the challenges that we're facing, so we have our aging and poor um, um, performing coal-fired power stations, we have the liquidity of our utilities such as ESCOM and financial challenges such as that, then we have lack of policy uncertainty, um, especially with the delays uh, in the integrated resource plan, yes we do have a 2019 resource plan, but that is already outdated and needs to be updated. We don't have um, much in terms of the energy uh, plan, the, the integrated energy plan. That really needs upgrading and updating for us to be able to enhance and enable these new technologies such as green hydrogen and uh, other energy technologies. We have infrastructure backlog, um, we have our primary energy challenges, and then um, you know there, there's other uh, challenges that we're actually facing. Um, but we we've also have a number of consequences that result from these challenges. Um, but adding to that is the opportunity that we have to actually move forward, um, to take this country forward, to be more successful into um, this just transition. Um, so what is our future focus then? Um, we, we obviously need to address these previously mentioned challenges, um, but uh, we have the, the international goals for climate change, as I've mentioned, and then we have the price pressure for finite uh, fossil fuels. Um, and we, we also have the National Development Plan, uh, the vision of transitioning to an environmentally sustainable, climate change resilient, low carbon and just society. So that, that is, is very key and critical to the opportunities that we can lend ourselves to. Um, this also uh, needs to, to include reliable uh, and efficient electricity. Um, so this just transition also needs to look at economic diversification, not only in the electricity sector, but in the energy sector as a whole. Um, and, you know, the, we're moving away from saying just energy transition to just transition because there are so many other opportunities in the economy that we could actually move towards in terms of making South Africa uh, and our, our society livelihoods um, much better and secured and not disregarded. Um, 
In terms of our integrated research plan that I've mentioned from 2019, which is out of date, but the trajectory does uh, talk to a new energy mix that includes a lot of renewable energy, uh, some gas as well, and uh, this is to replace the old coal-fired power stations. Um, but there's, there's also some discussion in terms of uh, can we actually have an accelerated renewable energy plan or a greener transition? Um, and this is also considering the constrained energy system that I've mentioned, as well as our, our need to meet our environmental and legal obligations in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Embedded generation and distributed energy resources is also another opportunity that can actually add a lot uh, to our system and, and, and you know, make it, making it a more secure and reliable system. Um, this is where you, you open up the sector for democratization of energy, that's a new buzzword now. Um, and you know, the decentralization and pulling away from ESCOM uh, and just leaving them to, to the wise business. Um, so CSR has done some further research into accelerating this decarbonization of energy um, and to the renewable energy sector and what could potentially be the cost premium for that, uh, if any, uh, for this pathway. And it was actually found that with the abundant land mass that we have, the, the uh, wind and solar resources that we're actually endowed with as a country, uh, this well positions us uh, to be quite su suitable for this accelerated decarbonization um, with very little net increase cost. Um, this opportunity also comes uh, with uh, additional job creation and in, into uh, a, a other uh, economic diversification options that we could have in terms of opportunity. So um, what about the energy sector? I've mentioned electricity and you know, electricity is actually almost like 25% of the energy se sector and then approximately the same amount is for uh, transport and, and heat industrial processes. Um, so looking into the energy sector, we do know that if we do need to meet the targets that we've put out in terms of the conscience of parties, we need to move towards the energy sector as well. You can't only remain in the electricity sector. And that's where we talk about green hydrogen and, you know, greening the liquid fuel sector, uh, electrifying the transport industry, and looking at, you know, the industrial uh, heat and thermal uh, processes as well. So um, we therefore need to be cognizant of all these developments, uh, obviously not losing focus on electricity because it is, is a problem as well. Um, and then what I would say is that there's major opportunities for growth for um, the likes of yourselves sitting in this room in terms of this new energy landscape that we are talking about and what other sectors we are, we are willing to open ourselves to. This is localization of these, um, these uh, technologies is also required, um, I think it, we need to probably pave the way in terms of demand going forward and know where we could you know, play our roles in terms of uh, each business and, and what uh, the, the strengths are. Um, but it also talks to circular economy opportunities. I think this topic is, is also um, uh, quite hot at the time. And it, it looks at how do we make sure that we go through these value change with, with minimized losses and um, you know, making use of everything that is uh, added to these uh, specific subsectors of these economies that we create. Um, so yeah, I, I would like to, to end up with that and um, say that it definitely leaves the, the pathway for, for these new opportunities. Lovely. Thanks, Thanks. Aradna. I think uh, you've mentioned COP and obviously the changes in terms of transition automotive. Uh, we look at even building sustainable and lasting businesses as Cecil. And uh, David, maybe going on to you, I mean, what are some of the dynamics that you guys see uh, as an organization within the space, given the macro changes? And, uh, you know, yesterday I was with a bank and everyone's talking about ESG now. And I, I wonder where the opportunities open up, right? Which is something that often comes through. And you've spoken about the circular economy as well. Yeah. So I think, um, thank you very much, for Abdullah, for the question. Uh, much appreciated. And I think uh, from a SASA perspective, we've uh, certainly applied our minds as regards to uh, what ESG offers us 
and uh, the opportunities that uh, that uh, that it beholds. And I think I'll let me let me start. I think we've uh, we set out our decarbonisation pathway, which was communicated via Capital Markets Day last year, and that set out in terms of the targets, in terms of the 30% emission reduction uh, by 2030, and then long-term net zero ambition. So those sort of sets out the, the boundaries in terms of, sort of how we look at it. But within that context, then you start saying, how do we actually go about in terms of this uh, transition? The leap, I mean, the leap from uh, sort of, we are a coal and gas-based uh, organization in terms of feedstock predominantly. So the leap to green hydrogen, yes, will take time. So within that phase, of course, you've got a transition, but you've got a transition in a manner as well where uh, you take in consideration the different aspects. So I think from a, I'll start with the G. The G, the, the G is the easy component. We've got the governance structure within our organization, and um, the board is assigned in terms of to make the decisions as, as pertains to uh, our long-term long, long goals, which have already been set out. So that's, that's, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's an easy component. The, the second component in terms of the social side is really where the just transition kicks in. And here, of course, as we transition, we're aware they're going to be, as we shift away from fossil fuels, there are going to be some uh, uh, unintended impacts. But of course, what you do is you apply your mind in terms of look at what are the sort of the opportunities within transitioning people from the current sort of fuel based industries into sort of the new technologies. And, and here you sort of look at, uh, we already do a fair bit of uh, um, upskilling uh, and skills uh, development work with uh, TVET colleges, vocational, even the universities, we've got a whole bursary uh, scheme. So we're actually not starting from zero. We've got a number of initiatives that are already in place. We already have initiatives where we work with the municipalities uh, within our fence line communities, where we have ongoing programs, which what you, what what would essentially look at is look at expanding those programs to ensure that then they ultimately then deliver on the opportunities. Be it, um, we've got significant land uh, out in terms of in Mpumalanga, which we're actually uh, looking to lease out in terms of for farming opportunities. So those type of initiatives we actually have on the table, which actually help us in terms of driving sort of the, the, the transition and opportunities within the areas. And then of course working, I think it was earlier mentioned in the previous session, around uh, economic zones. So if you do get, let's say, certain areas uh, around in Pumalanga, let's say, classified as economic zone, it will open up a number of opportunities in terms of lowering the, the barrier to entry for small businesses. Then another critical element which is aligned with our decarbonization pathway is what's been alluded to earlier is around the renewable energy. We've gone out to market to secure uh, 900 megawatts of renewable energy in partnership with Air, with Air, with Air Liquide at the moment. And that offers a big uh, component, and that's the biggest, uh, big, biggest private uh, company placement as it stands at the moment uh, in the country, to my, to my knowledge if I'm not wrong. And a uh, component of that as well is we've specified that there has to be localization to whichever of the independent power producers supply us the power. So that's, those are some critical components in terms of how we are stepping through in terms of the uh, ESG as you asked your question and what are we, what are we actually tangibly doing to make sure that we, we have results on the table. In terms of the environmental side, of course, it's the, really the decarbonization component. So here, I think, um, as you are aware, we're the, the second largest emitter within the country behind ESCOM, far behind ESCOM, um, but it's still a significant footprint. So, but that's why we've looked at uh, outlining our decarbonization pathways. We have, um, in terms of the 2030 as outlined in our emission reduction program, we don't anticipate any significant uh, job impacts uh, from our transition. We've mapped it out such that most of the solutions are energy and process efficiency, which means they're just really on-site solutions. Uh, then the introduction of renewable energies, and then the other component is introduction of gas. So we've mapped our way in such a way that we minimize any any but the significant impacts from a social uh, from a socioeconomic uh, perspective. Of course, beyond 2030, there will be uh, 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 some impacts, but that's where we're working on developing our just transition roadmap as it stands today to ensure that by that time we are well prepared and you've also prepared the people for the opportunity when it actually does does arise. So the other environmental issues are in terms of beat water waste and uh, sort of air, 
a emissions, air emission is really a compliance thing, so which we do um, according to the compliance considerations. Um, and there we're also looking to ensure that we reduce our, our sulfur dioxide emissions so that we ensure that from an air, air perspective we're also compliant in that regard. And then water, we, we run what is called a zero liquid effluent facility in Secunda. What this means is you just recycle all the water and you're actually able to reuse that uh, uh, within, the, within the process and limit how much you ab abstract from the river. And if there's any, Sasselberg is a discharge facility, so it discharges back into the environment, but you discharge water at, its, uh, at the appropriate quality that doesn't deteriorate the water bodies. So those are the, some of the elements that just give some examples in terms of how we're looking at sort of ESG as a, uh, from an organizational point of view. And I think it's also important that we do, we, we have, let me end at this, we have structured ourselves in a way where uh, there's clear decision making within the organization to ensure that the decisions are made at the right level, given the materiality of, uh, uh, of sort of ESG considerations to the business as it stands. So I think I'll leave it. Thanks. Very practical views in terms of what you're doing on, on all three elements of environment, sustainability and governance. Lovely. Stuart, let's bring you in. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, some thoughts on the work you're doing, Stuart? And benefiting society. Then there's a technology and uh, uh, innovation element, the better brand and reputation. So all of these uh, play a very big role in terms of the, uh, the business case for taking uh, climate change uh, seriously. In terms of uh, the, we've heard what the just transition is, that uh, seeking to ensure that uh, the substantial benefits of the green uh, economy transition are shared widely and, and those uh, supporting, um, uh, supporting those who stand to, to lose, in other words, workers and communities in particular, from the transition from, uh, from a, a carbon benefiting society. Um, I, think I think we can stop that loop. So um, Stuart is just connected on a different line, so we're just going to get him on the correct line. And okay. then, so if we can just maybe do two questions here, sure. and then we'll go back to Stuart. Thanks. Perfect. So I think a few things, right? I think the one that uh, is coming through quite strongly is that big government, big business have a very clear directive. There's a 2030 target, there's regulation, there's legislation, there's a need, there's pressure, decarbonization matters. But how does medium, emerging businesses participate in this? I mean... You know, yesterday I, and I'm in the space, I, I hear words that just go over my head at times. And so how do we make it real? Like as a business owner, how do I bring this into my space or think about, one, the impact and then the opportunity? And I'll, I'll open it up to both of you. Thank you. No, perfect. I'll, 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 take, a, I'll take a step to begin with. Um, I think the, the opportunity, um, let me start, the way we've, we sort of position just transition from a SASA point of view is you sort of you look at the just component, it's got to be, it's inclusive transformation. Uh, and then you, it's in inclusive transformation for business, for society, um, and as well as um, to ensure that, uh, and to ensure that there's prosperity at the end. So it's, it ensures that you look at all the different components associated uh, with the transition to, to make sure that there is shared value in the end in terms of how we deliver on the transition. And then, so that's the just, the just component. The transition, of course, is then the sort of the energy component. We've, of course, got a transition in terms of from a business point of view in a sustainable manner. At the same time, there's an expectation that you'll create employment. The, yes, whilst the value chains will change, there is still opportunity in the new value chains. So it's not disruptive that if I lose my opportunity, you know, I was, I was involved in the core value chain. If I lose that opportunity, I can't shift in terms of into renewable. And that those are the elements that we, we're beginning to look at and from a Versace point of view uh, to ensure that there is the opportunity to, to pivot in terms of into what the new value chains uh, will start to look like. I'll take an example, let's say, let me take the easy example that I think that's been spoken to in terms of hydrogen. So if you look at green hydrogen, you've got the first component to be really uh, the energy side in terms of how do you get the energy. So it's a renewable energy component. So there could be opportunities in terms of be it solar, sort of within the solar space, you could be part of producing in terms of panels. You could be, you could have opportunities in terms of uh, wind turbines. There's an opera, there's, I think there's, uh, it's in the University of the Western Cape. They actually have set up a, a, 
a facility where they'll be training up uh, technicians for wind turbines. So you, we can start to involve in terms of in different components of the value chain. So that's just one example in terms of the sort of the energy side. Then if you look at the, if you then to take the hydrogen uh, value chain, sort of after the energy part, um, then you've also got sort of the electrolytic part. So there there will be opportunities. So that's an entirely new area. So there's, it's nascent, it's, it's, um, it's new. But I mean, working with sort of, uh, um, working with businesses like ourselves and say, these are the, I mean, the thing is that the technology itself uh, but it skills modular. It's yes, there is some um, there is some sort of uh, some technical know-how which may be priority, but the basics in terms of offering services and support to it, it still remains the same. It's still it's, it's still it's still, it's still a piece of equipment. So there's still areas within that as well where where people can then participate. And yeah, of course, the thing is that around the hydrogen production, granted the hydrogen production itself uh, from the electrolytic process will, uh, will then uh, involve a little bit, uh, will involve a little bit more where, let's say, our uh, spe spe speciality then comes in. But there are already services that um, people that work in terms of with SASL who can then involve with different components within uh, our, our value chain that can then participate. And then there is on the, the back end, there's uh, logistics, transportation, et cetera, moving around because you start to a whole new uh, network in terms of moving material around. So there's the different opportunities if you sort of break the value chain into it's the sum of the parts where people can participate and then work with the big industries, of course, that overarching, but then uh, as well as uh, able to contribute and uh, actually add, add value in, the, in that space. So it's not, it's not a case of seeing that uh, if, if I shift from the fossil fuel side, my opportunities will disappear. Yeah. You just need to reframe how you think about it and how you look at the opportunities that may arise within the, the sort of the new energy space. So I just gave an example of the hydrogen, but the other areas as well in terms of if you start to look a little bit longer uh, in that regard. So Fantastic. I think what I'm getting is uh, obviously that there is a fast direction globally, continentally, and locally, in fact, in terms of this trust tran just transition, targets are in place. We have to all pivot, and part of that is my understanding would be understand the space better, understand what's going on in the space, and then ask yourself, the way I said in my keynote, what are my capabilities and can I translate them into new capabilities or opportunities that come in? So where might one, Radna, given your work, you know, get more insight, more awareness, more understanding of the space? So um, we at the CSR has a have actually identified this as a gap, right. um, and we are currently um, developing and, and almost uh, completing the proposal for an energy industry support program, where um, we we have in the past year, last year, we we've uh, teamed up with Saika Ed uh, to to help SMMEs for uh, their developmental ideas in the space, uh, specifically looking at the just tran transition elements and how we could actually um, add the technical know-how because I, I think what you, you're trying to get as is yes we know this big picture but how do we actually know what the technical elements are and where do we as an enterprise fit in there because you may have a certain capability but you may not not know that you know technically is that going to be viable in that specific value chain or not um, and I think we we um, are aiming to to help that that specific gap with our energy industry support program as I've mentioned and we've also partnered um, now with the black management forum uh, where we want to intend on doing the similar thing in terms of um, helping with the technical know-how from uh, uh, you know development uh, development developing the the business case as well as de-risking services for that bus business case so okay. um, yeah that's that's two of the things and then in terms of skills development, we've also uh, just signed an um, MOU with uh, EW CETA um, to actually identify for this future landscape what skills is required for South Africa. We're finding very, um, yeah, very shocking information in terms of, you know, the, the words were used, you're getting skilled to joblessness in <laughs> TVET colleges. And that is what's happening in South Africa. And so people don't even know what skills are required because they don't know what technical aspects form within those value chains. And I think it's, it's platforms like this that can help uh, enterprise developments to give you more information in terms of what these value 
value chains look like and where if you have a, sp a certain capability where you can actually lie within these value chains. Lovely, some brilliant work. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, maybe, sorry. Guys, for Stuart, we're not going to be able to get him back on the okay. line. The technical issue is just not working. Sure, no Thanks. problem. So we've got 15 minutes, and what I want to do is bring you into the room, which is critical. So I know you're in the room, but onto the stage. And so I'm going to open up and see if there's uh, any questions, comments, uh, clarity, anything you'd like to know, anything that piqued your interest. Uh, the circular economy is something that's particularly interesting, and uh, both uh, David and Aradna spoke to it. Anything that is particularly interesting, or, or a question or a point of clarity that you want, if you can introduce yourself, uh, tell us where you're from, and then we'll open the questions. So the lady in the back. Oh, you've got the back, sorry. Anybody with <laughs> questions? There's a lady here with white. We also have two questions from the people joining at home via Slido. Okay, lovely. So we'll bring you, the two of you from Slido in very shortly. And you're only allowed to ask the question if you support Liverpool football clubs. So <laughs> just clarify that and then ask the question. And please introduce yourself. Tell us where you're from, what you do. I thought the gentleman is going to go first. Okay, thank you. My name is Bongis Lubani. I'm the managing director for Kubiala ICT Solutions. Um, we are an ICT solutions provider. I don't have a question per se, but um, um, something that was mentioned around Tibet colleges. And I think as SMMEs, we try by all means to have access to graduates and Tibet college students to be able to create employment. But the challenge that I think we find as a country is that most of our students come out of TVs and universities with no practical or real world experience whatsoever, which makes it very difficult to integrate them into the working environment or into the professional environment. So how can we together as a country give our youth, our young people, real world experience? Um, we're looking at a country that's got a, a lot of dilapidated buildings that could be turned into places for, for practicing and you know, practical uh, exercise. So that when, when they come out of TVET, the only thing they know is theory. And in a work environment, theory is different um, to practical. So what is really needed is hands-on skills. Um, and I think we need to extend our TVET colleges to give practical examples. So for instance, myself, my background is a technical um, engineer from an ICT, I can build a desktop from scratch. But I can tell you right now, I can get a student who's got a degree that I don't have that cannot build a laptop from scratch. How do we resolve that together as a country? Thank you. So it's those practical, tangible skills. And in fact, uh, I was in uh, France and Germany two weeks ago, and Germany's entire economy is built uh, in a big component on technical skills, right? It's a contributor to employment. It's a contributor to skills. It's a contributor to the hands of the industry. And I'm working at the moment with some institutions around the fact that there isn't the recognition and the importance of it, right? How do we bring that in? So that's a big factor. The second factor is we have... Uh, elements in terms of the medical sector where people are doing internships, but I think it must be done all over, right? Because many young people who are graduating aren't finding jobs because they don't have the experience or the actual skills, right? Which is so important. Lovely question. Uh, let's go to, I think there was a gentleman somewhere here. No. I think Abdullah just to sure, add, go ahead. Um, just to add to your response, um, I think from a SASA perspective, what we do is when we do engage with the, uh, with the vocational training institutions as well is we've, we also look at the curriculum to ensure that the curriculum starts to suit the type of skills that you'll be needing. So you, you've got, um, I think it's four year cycles if I'm not wrong. So you look at the sort of the cycles as well in terms of which you, at, when you will get sort of the, gradu the graduate, such that they do come in ultimately with the curriculum to ensure that they come in the, the right theoretical skills, then we have the sort of the practical training as part of, a part of when they actually come into the organization. Such that they're at the point where um, after a certain period of time, they've got both the theory, theoretical component, they've got the practical component. If they choose, of course, if they have the opportunity to join SASO and want to, to stay within SASO, then of course the career follows their, for that, that path. And if they do exit, then at least they are well prepared to then um, go essentially look at the world and see what the opportunity, they, what the offer is. So those are some of the elements uh, that we have. I don't have the hardcore numbers, but there's a fair bit of a 
of money that actually is put towards that, which is then uh, communicated through a sustainability development report on an annual basis in terms of how much we do from that, uh, from that perspective. So I think just to add to that in terms of uh, the other component that we, that we do, and we're also looking at potential partnerships as well to see how we can expand that as well and work with other uh, organizations and institutions to get in the right skills for the sort of the, let's say, the green economy. Oh, Thank fantastic. you. Fantastic. Let's take the two questions on Slido and then we'll, we'll come to you, ma'am. Well, the other question has been addressed, and then okay. there's one question from Anonymous who says he's enjoying the conversation. He or she's Anonymous, so where, where are you <laughs> hiding, she or he? <laughs> <laughs> I was enjoying the conversation, but they want to know that um, as an SME with limited resources, what could they practically do to start to um, forecast and adapt for an uncertain future? Arana, I see you want to answer that, so we'll give it to you. <laughs> Um, I think it, it, it boils down to, uh, you know, being able to, to have the technical know-how. I, I think, you know, you have to have a certain number of questions that you put forward and then you need to be able to answer them. And whether you do the research yourself or, you, you know, you, you try and collaborate with partners who are willing to, to um, put funding into these things. And there are funders, like res for Africa, there, there's a lot of training that they, they um, give to, uh, to South Africans for the renewable energy industry as well as other greener uh, energies. And there's... There are these small opportunities that I would say are free, but I think you would need to be properly on the on the social platforms and and you know know who um, or where to look for for these opportunities. I would so, say. so to build on what you say, I, I, I'll also add the following: is one, and I gave you a very personal example of myself, is when you are facing a cash flow problem or there's uncertainty in the environment or there's a massive social unrest, as we see in KZN in July. As, a, as an entrepreneur who's so vested in your business, you become so enamored that your focus only is on that. And sometimes you need somebody to pull you out and to show you that let's deal with the uncertainty now, but let's put it within perspective. Let's look at the system, right? And sometimes I know it's hard, right? When you've got cash flow, as I said to you, when money is just coming out of your bank account and there's nothing coming in, you think to yourself, am I ever going to survive this, right? But somebody needs to take you from the dance floor onto the balcony and say, look at the picture. I think that's the first. I think the second is you need a external board of advisors. Uh, and these are friends and people who know you, but who can be very frank and honest with you, who you can go to and say, this is what I'm facing. And they, non-emotional, can say, well, this is how I see it. I see it differently. And I would reach out. I still have people like this in my own life where I can go to and be honest and say, I'm seeing things this way. I don't want to talk to my staff about it, but I'm asking you, what are your thoughts? The third is, is asking this question, what do I know versus what do I need to know? And where are the opportunities? So for me, I think both of you have elucidated so brilliantly where the world is going and where sectors are going. And I'm hearing this all the time. My question is, as a business owner, what do I know and what do I need to know? How do I find it out? And then where do I get the technical skills, which, mm -hmm. as we've heard, are there? Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Abdul. Um, my name is Nokolo, um, and I am one of the 15 um, females for, that were selected for the Sasol Women in Engineering um, okay. Incubator Program. Um, so I run a company called PL Construction or Phenomenal Light, and we um, specialize or focus on concrete re rehabilitation and, and repairs, right, um, for all the new structures. Now, with saying that, we have also, I'm a, a recent EdTech startup founder, um, we haven't launched as yet, um, speaking to, to the element of skills development, etc. and you mentioned Germany, um, whose youth unemployment rate, I think, sits at about 5%, 5 percent, 5 point something percent, um, and we're in the 60s, right? Um, and to that particular point, I think um, a solution or one of the solutions, because there's going to be many solutions that we're going to have to come up with, you know, as leaders, um, is for each industry, you know, private sector, um, to work together, of course, with government, to set up um, not just hubs, but basically like um, schools that specifically focus on that sector, right, um, that gives um, the skills development that we need youth to have when they are coming out of high school. So what we are building is basically a personalized platform that will be able to speak to each very, very affordable, that will be able to speak to the learner 
individually, because that's a big thing. We, we're having career development and support or career um, days or whatever it is that these schools are having for these learners from grade eight to grade 12. And they're doing this whole umbrella fit um, where they're all taken to university for an open day or someone comes and talks to all of them about whatever industry they're coming to talk about. So we're building a platform that will speak to each learner individually and will still be able to scale quite fast with what we're building, right? Um, so I believe that for them to have those skills that we're speaking to right now, the lady said there that these, these the, we're taking them out of the Tibet College and we can't do much with them. We're facing the same problem. Um, but if we literally had your, your Sassel, thank you for the work that you are doing, you know, um, and your other um, industry leaders actually set up these schools, right, where these learners can actually go from or while they're in high school, because that's what they're doing in Germany, have school and, right, the, the, the actual practical knowledge of, I want to go and be an IT specialist but I'm also spending time in the classroom. I'm also spending time learning practically on the job how to be a good IT technician or whatever it is that they want to go into engineering, right? So if those industry leaders could actually set up things like that, then we wouldn't have, because then you can reach more young people. You can have a, a school that takes 2,000 here and another school, do you understand? We start sure. small and we build up with that. That I think is one of the solutions that we can start setting up. Brilliant, lovely, 100%. Okay. Can I? Yeah, all right now. Yes, sorry, so just, um, I think maybe before we get to that stage, we need to solve the problem in the TVET colleges first. Because if the curriculum isn't set up for what we need it to be, then we need to be able to say, this is the skills roadmap, this is how we develop these skills, and this is what we, you know, to a certain level, of course. And then at the end, you get those specialized schools to, you know, go deeper into the technician or the technical capabilities or the know-how in terms of the on-the-ground training. And that's what um, I think EWC has aiming to do and what we're trying to help them do as well. Um, I've mentioned Res for Africa, they're also trying to look at curriculums to, do, to be developed in Mpumalanga specifically because that is the core region that's going to be affected and that's where the transition we are hoping is going to be going in, in the renewable sector, which hasn't been happening. Um, but yeah, I think that's the first thing we need to, you, we need to solve the problems that we created and then, because they've mentioned skill to joblessness, that is what it is. And who would want to take a person that doesn't have the skills that they need? Yeah. So, yeah. 100%. Mm. We've got time for one last question over there. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> I'd just like to ask the panelists, are the platforms, that they can, the, the threats they can share with the SMMEs we, from which we can get access to information around all the issues that we discussed today? Yeah, I mean, certainly from a, a SASA perspective, uh, there are a number of uh, my colleagues in the room uh, who I think are well placed and um, we can put you in touch certainly. Uh, around what the platforms are available, the contact persons, the contact numbers as well, to make sure that I think that you make, can get the relevant information to then uh, help position yourself in terms of what you need to do, what information is required. So that's, uh, I think, we're certainly in a position to support in that regard. Thank you. Lovely. Arana? Um, I would just mention, because I've mentioned the Black Management Forum, I'm not sure if you are uh, a member of them, but uh, I think that they are now, you know, going into a, a roadmap in terms of having this um, key, uh, what can I say, uh, conversations around the technical aspects of these specific, uh, you know, energy transitions and, and, inf and provide the SMMEs that information in terms of technical know-how. And the CSR is, is going to be a part of those uh, going forward as well. Lovely. I want to close and hand back to Nsiki by maybe reflecting on, on what you said. So I attended a wedding last week and, uh, you know, Indian weddings are very big for some reason. Uh, and now people are happy with COVID down that they can come back in. So any event, I'm sitting at a table and um, I'm hearing at the table next to me two of my uncles advising 
a cousin of mine who's in grade 12 about what to study. And my one uncle says, you must become a chartered accountant because they make big bucks. And the other uncle says, yeah, 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 I know chartered accountants and this is what will happen and it's such a cool career and I, I'm holding myself back. And eventually I stand up and I go and I say, on what basis are you advising him? And that night they call my mom and they say, Abdullah's gone quite rude because like he's pulled us back. And I think the reality is our teachers, our career guidance counselors, us as parents, are living in a world that's 20 years old, right? Mm -hmm. The world has changed. There's new opportunities. There's 2030. There's technology. Mm -hmm. And the, the only way to the future is not just in a university education. I say this as an academic coming from a business school. There's so many paths, but how do we get that message across and bring that to the fore? Which is something that we've got to think about very cleverly. Thank you so much to my panelists for some very practical, very good perspectives, and also for sharing quite honestly. And let me hand back to Nsiki. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I um, appreciate you sharing your insights with us. I'm just going to um, let everybody know what's happening next. So you're most welcome to exit the stage in that direction. Thank you so much. Um, so I've seen the comments and I've noted, uh, so I just, Ben, I did see your question. I think we'll, we'll ask that question later on because I think it's more fitted to a panel session that we're having later on. And just for some of the comments that came through, um, Timothy, thank you so much for your comments saying that um, what Abdullah said is very powerful. I strongly believe it is useful to a lot of us. And Bandilu, who said this was a very awesome session and eye-opening presentation from Mr. Abdullah. So thank you so much. Um, I'm sure you guys are hungry, right? You're like, ah. Oh. It's time to eat. Okay, definitely is time to eat. So we're going to take a break um, and go have lunch. Lunch will be until 2 p.m. So can I please ask that you just you know watch watch the clock and make sure that you're back in the room so that we can start at two o'clock. And obviously everyone who's joining us from home, you have a breather as well. And please be back at your screen 2 p.m. So lunch is at the building next door um, in the rest across, okay, this, across, this next door. So if you go out through the, the sliding doors this way, uh, to the right-hand side of the corner of the restaurant, you'll see that's where lunch has been set up for us. And because, you know, we love to share and to give, specifically to our online people, it's an Oprah day for you, uh, we'll be giving away uh, copies of Abdullah's book, Disruption Amplified, Reset, Rewire, Reimagine Everything. Um, and the quote here from Professor Nick Bindel says, a punchy and timely commentary, commentary on issues that are, that are of strategic importance in our time. And I think judging by his talk, it's a fantastic book to read. So for those of you at home, um, we will be doing 10, copy, 10 copies, right? Giveaways for those of you who participate and engage with us on the app. So I've seen your questions, I've seen you asking, I've seen you commenting. We're taking note, but you have until the end of the day to get your engagement up so that you can win a copy of the book. And for the people in the room, we will see. We'll see how Oprah feels today. <laughs> I'll see you all back in the room at two o'clock. Enjoy lunch. Thanks.